Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. I hope that you had a nice weekend. Although I'm well aware that virtually all of you, if not all of you, are stuck inside and um, with a curfew and unable to leave your home. So California's had a rough year. Obviously, the wildfire season was as bad as ever, and the COVID lockdowns have been grueling. And so my heart goes out to you, and I'm just happy that you're here tonight and that we are together. You've been so focused in class, and you've done such a good job that I really applaud you. And I hope that we can continue to muddle through and, um, and finish up the semester strong. I want to make some comments about housekeeping items before we get started. Um, I'll have much more to say about the exam on Wednesday. Some of you have noticed that your grades are not up. Um, that's basically because the exams were sent to the reader in two batches and the reader didn't send the small batch back. Just a bit of a delay. I'm really sorry about that. I was expecting to get them back a few days ago, but with everything being virtual and without being in person, it's kind of hard to get things quickly. The average though is an 86 and I'm very pleased with the exams. I thought you did a very good job. Those of you who don't have your grade yet, I've spoken with many of you already. Um, I apologize again, but because there was such a delay in getting the grades posted, I decided that it was essential to post them as soon as possible, even if some of them um, aren't just up just yet. Those of you who um, are still waiting, <clears throat> if you, um, want to reach out to me and discuss this further, we can, but it just has to do with, with a bit of a delay in, in getting some of the, the graded score sheets back. Those of you who have had your score sheet posted, I just encourage you to take a look at your score sheet and see where you missed points and um, what you did particularly well on. That can be very, very useful for you as you prepare for the, the, the rest of the semester or as you think about whether you wanna do the extra credit I'll talk about the extra credit here in a moment. Uh, the final paper, as a reminder, is, is due on Friday. That's this Friday, December 11th. And I'm gonna post the link tomorrow. Today we'll begin lecture by briefly discussing the assignment and I'll go over and elaborate on the assignment a little bit. That was requested last class, last Wednesday, and I'm happy to elaborate and give you some more details about this. The syllabus has had the assignment description since the beginning of class. Um, and the short paper that you wrote was designed to get you prepared for the long paper, but you will want to approach the long paper a little bit differently. And so I'm gonna talk about that. And regarding the extra credit assignment, I'm going to post the extra credit assignment on December 11th, and you'll have a full week to complete it if you want to. It's up to you. You don't have to. It'll be due by December 18th. So you'll have seven days. The format of the extra credit assignment will be similar to the format of the midterm, where you have some concepts for definition and um, an essay prompt uh, or two, potentially. But I do promise that the extra credit assignment will be a reasonable length and won't be too demanding. The goal is to incentivize completing it. I don't want to dissuade you from doing it, so I won't ask that you do that much. But it is designed to be extra credit, and I do want to encourage you to seek out all of the possible points that you might get. Um, I'm going to talk more about that on Wednesday, and I'll have much more detail uh, about the way that will work. But as a reminder, it, it is extra credit and it'll be a format similar to the midterm. It's just that you'll have a full week to do it. There will not be a, a study guide for that extra credit assignment. This has been asked a couple times. The reason I'm not going to provide a study guide is because there is no time constraint. So that study guide that I gave you for the midterm was mainly designed to prepare you uh, as much as possible ahead of time 
um, by sort of absorbing the content, thinking about the themes and the readings so that you could be prepared to write about the, them when you, when you came up um, during the exam. Since we don't have that time constraint, I don't think that it's as important uh, or even necessary to, to give you that extra credit um, study guide. So the extra credit will be due December 18th. That gives you a full week. And I'll give you more information about that on Wednesday. That's December 9th. Before I talk more about the term paper and I elaborate on that assignment, uh, I'm happy to take any comments or questions that you might have. Carla says, can the extra credit hurt our grade or will it only be added if it helps our grade? No, Carla, it can't hurt your grade. So whatever you get goes towards um, just kind of padding your grade. So, you know, theoretically, you can only get some of the points and miss most of them and still come out better than if you didn't do it at all. Uh, it cannot hurt your grade. It's only added. Karen says, will we get feedback for the final paper as well? Uh, the plan is to get you some feedback. Are there additional comments or questions about any of these housekeeping items? Yeah, when will we get the feedback from the first essay? Yeah, so the plan has been to try to get you that this week uh, within the next couple days. And that's something that I'm gonna be trying to do the reader won't be able to do that. Uh, but the goal is to get it to you by Wednesday. And because the question, the questions on the syllabus are given to you and because it's not an original research paper, um, in some ways, the feedback can be a little bit more targeted and there's less individual initiative in terms of like thinking about countries to, to bring into the analysis. So I should be able to provide you that feedback and uh, it should take less time than if it was a research paper. Jason says, can you post the term paper assignment so we could submit it? Yeah, I was planning on creating the link for that tomorrow. But I also want to encourage you to wait and give yourself time to, to get any feedback from the short paper assignment. So if, if you can, maybe wait until you know, Wednesday or Thursday, just because I, I do intend to try to get you some feedback. Maybe just submit it when you don't have any other time left to, to submit it. Are there additional comments or questions? So let's discuss the term paper assignment. It was, asked last week if I could elaborate on the assignment and talk to you a little bit more about what's expected. So this is the prompt from the syllabus, and this is the prompt as it's been written since uh, the first day class. Choose one of the questions listed on the syllabus from lectures one through 14. Respond to it in a paper of 2,500 words structured as follows. Part one, the question, plan of the paper, and synopsis of the argument. Part two, a review of the core theoretical debate in the literature. Part three, a summary of the empirical literature and existing evidence. Part four, conclusions and implications. And part five, end notes, a list of literature and references used in the paper. So we'll go part by part. In part one, you simply need to identify the question that you selected from the syllabus. Identify it clearly so that I know which one you're addressing. You also want to outline the plan of the paper. That is this, what you'll be doing in the paper. And then you want to provide a brief synopsis of the argument. Now this is really your introduction where you identify the question, the outline or the plan for the paper, and then you state your thesis statement which summarizes your argument. Part two is the first part of the body of the paper where you review the core theoretical debate in the literature. That is, what is the underlying disagreement or conflict or debate that this question comes out of? What is the sort of overarching disagreement or, or conversation that this question fits into? 
Many of you might be wondering, how do I figure that out? Well, I'll give you a little bit of a hint. And the way you figure it out is you complete the reading by Norris and TRL. Those books that we do reading from for the different weeks in this class address the key debates in the literature and also talk about the key perspectives and the, the evidence, the existing evidence. And so if your question comes from a particular week, I encourage you to review the reading from that week and use that reading to identify the, the overarching debate that this question that you're addressing comes from. That's the best place to look for that. You might also, of course, want to read beyond what I provide and what I assign for the course, but you should be able to find what you need by reviewing the reading for the, the assigned week or the, the, the question um, the assigned reading. Part three, a summary of the empirical literature and existing evidence. You can also review the assigned reading to find out the contours of the literature and the existing evidence as well. Although here you'll, you'll need to cite a little bit more in terms of the literature. You'll want to go outside beyond those assigned readings a little bit to demonstrate that you've read beyond what I've assigned. And you can do that by following some of the citations in the reading that's been assigned from the class, uh, as well as using Google Scholar or you said Merced Libraries uh, databases. You could use a variety of, of different places to find out where to go to, to get some additional articles. And in that part three, when, I, when you provide that summary of the empirical literature and existing evidence, you also want to interpret it in a way that supports your argument in that paper. Now, when you conclude the paper, you want to reiterate that argument and you want to provide a, a brief discussion of the implications of the argument. Now, if your question asks you to provide um, some analysis of cases that you've selected, you do that in part three. You do that as, par as part of part three. Not all questions require you to do that. Some of them do. The questions are designed to be fairly equal in terms of what they demand of you. It's just that what you chose to write about will influence whether you have to fulfill certain requirements. Finally, the end notes. This is important because you want to list the literature that you use in, in the paper so that you can demonstrate to me that you've gone beyond the assigned reading and that you're familiar with some of the literature out there for the topic. So you'll want to identify those clearly with a list of references in the end notes. And you can use whatever convention style is appropriate or whatever you deem appropriate or, or acceptable. MLA, APA, Chicago, they're all acceptable as long as you're consistent and you stick to the conventions. Um, this is an outline of, of the paper, and this is a brief elaboration on the different parts. But generally speaking, all papers must do four things. And those four things are as follows. First, you have to identify and discuss the core debate in the literature. So where does this question come from, right? What is this question a part of in terms of the overall debate? Where does it fit in? How does it fit into the existing conversation that's taking place in democratization studies? Second, you have to develop an argument in response to the, the chosen question. And your argument is going to be your own original claim, your own original argument in response to this question. And in response to this overall conversation. You want to develop this argument through your evaluation of the evidence. And if that means carrying out some case studies that are required as part of the prompt, then that's what that means. It could mean evaluating the existing evidence in the literature. However you go about evaluating the information or the evidence that's relevant, you want to do so in a way that supports your argument, your central argument, which is itself a response to that key question. 
And then finally, the fourth thing that you need to do is you need to summarize the key points and consider their implications. So if it's true what you say, what else must be true? Or if you took that out of the world, how would the world change? These are the kinds of questions you wanna think about as you consider the implications of your argument and summarize your key points. Carla says, just to clarify, so our essay is more about exploring and analyzing the literature with regards to the question we choose. So Carla, it does involve exploring and analyzing the literature. You wanna explore and analyze the literature in a way that allows you to make an argument, right? So your argument is your response to that question. And your argument you make based on a sort of interpretation or kind of an exploration of the, of the literature. And you wanna interpret that literature in a way that you can use to support your argument. Or maybe you wanna form an argument through your evaluation of the literature. So there is an argument that you form and you do have kind of an original claim that you organize your paper around, but you wanna develop that argument around um, a, a sort of evaluation of the evidence. And you wanna think about the evidence in a way that is, is, is particular to you, right? So you, you, you address that question um, and you make an argument in the process, but you use the, the, the literature to support your argument. And of course, if, you're, if you've chosen a, a question that requires you to do some case analysis, that could also help to, to support your argument that you make in response to that question. So let me give you an example of how I would go about this, this term paper. Um, my question that I chose is, how serious is the current democratic recession? This is a question from early on in the course. And my argument is that it's quite serious because the new authoritarianism has obtained a popular legitimacy previous authoritarianisms did not. And the debate, the underlying debate, is between those who interpret the recession as a, as a third reverse wave of democratization and those who do not. And you'll recall that early on in the semester, I gave you a reading that engaged this debate and took on this question. That was one side of the debate. There are other positions and there are other perspectives primarily on the other side which says that it is a, a third reverse wave. This underlying debate is where this question how serious is the current democratic recession comes from. Now my evaluation of the evidence in my discussion of the evidence in my use of the evidence to support my argument in my paper would go like this. I would evaluate the, argue, the article that I assigned as well as some others, and I would point out that it shows that we are not yet in a third reverse wave if we are using Huntington's conception of a third reverse wave. But I would also point out that the evidence shows that the new authoritarianism is increasingly populist. That is to say that the new authoritarian regimes in the new form of democratic backsliding, much more populist than ever before, and so images like these are more relevant than ever before. Fidesz in, what is that, Hungary? Yeah, it's Hungary. Fidesz, the sort of authoritarian government uh, in, in Hungary in the kind of collapse of democracy in that country under a sort of populist government that has significant popular support in society among ordinary people the role of voting in the sort of authoritarian uh, imposition of elections and the way that elections are used to validate uh, authoritarian rule. Um, the election or the rise to power of, of who is essentially a populist authoritarian in Italy. These are all examples that come from the, the literature. There's significant evidence that the new authoritarianism is populist. And so my interpretation of the evidence is that while there is not a third reverse wave, the new authoritarianism is increasingly populist. And so therefore it is serious because it can legitimate itself in a way that 
that earlier forms of populism cannot. And so that would be my paper. And I would discuss the implications of that where um, a you know, potential implication is that there's probably more popular support for authoritarian governments than ever before. And a, a, an implication might be that they'll probably survive longer than earlier episodes of authoritarian reversal. Uh, and, and there could be other implications as well. But that's how I would approach the assignment. And this is a, a strategy that, that I would use to try to satisfy all of the different criteria for the assignment. Now, inevitably, um, you'll do this in your own way and you'll think of this and interpret the evidence in a creative way that is unique to you. And I want to encourage you to do that and to demonstrate knowledge in a way that, that is, is, is particular and is unique and creative. And that's one thing that we can do with this assignment even as we engage in, in the conventions of good, good research and, and um, the evaluation of evidence and the engaging in, in debates. So before we continue, does anyone have any questions or comments about this term paper? My goal here has been to try to elaborate and give you more of a sense of how you can attack this. Okay, so it sounds like it's as clear as mud. If you can hear that, that's um, my neighbors that have a, a newborn. He sounds very, very happy. Okay. All right. We're beginning a new unit in the last unit in this course. And this is a unit on executive powers in democratic regimes. As we know, countries have choices. They have choices about how they choose their leaders. They have choices about how they distribute seats after elections for the legislature. They have choices about how they'll distribute power within the territory, either federally or according to a, univer a unitary state design, and so on and so forth. Countries have choices, and the choices they make might impact the survival of democracy and they might impact uh, the, the stability of the democratic regime and how well the democratic regime performs more generally. And so far in this course, we've discussed choices that countries have about legislative institutions, things like the electoral system and whether it's majoritarian or proportional. We talked about to some degree the choices countries have when it comes to whether it'll be a unitary state or a federal state. And today we're focusing on that other important choice, which is whether the country will be presidential or prime ministerial. And an interesting starting point for this discussion about presidentialism versus parliamentarism in new democracies is James Madison, who said in Federalist number 47, when the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person or in the same body of mag magistrates, there can be no liberty. And what James Madison is saying is that presidential democracy is one way and the only way. There is no alternative for free peoples since there can be no liberty when the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person. To put it a different way, there can be no liberty under parliamentary democracy. Instead, there must be a separation of powers between the president and the executive. And those two figures must be independently elected. And free peoples must decide independently on the anointing of those, of those two bodies. That was Federalist number 47 when, where James Madison said that. And he made it very clear that he sided with presidentialism when it comes to this debate. But there are others who are far less sure about the merits of presidentialism. And in particular, students of African politics and Latin American politics have been very skeptical that presidentialism is the one and only way. 
And so Van Cranenberg, who I assigned for you to read this week, said, a high degree of presidential power bodes ill for democracy and good governance in Africa. So whereas Madison said that there can be no freedom where power is concentrated in the hands of a single person, Van Cranenberg says that the concentration of power in the hands of a single person bodes poorly for democracy and good governance in Africa. So this is the other perspective, the idea that no, in fact, in fact, there should be a concentration of power in the hands of the executive, at least as compared to a presidential regime. Now, what's interesting is that these are the two sides of the, the debate in the larger question of whether presidentialism or parliamentarism is, is more democratic, whether one survives longer than the other and whether one is, is more prone to break down than the other. And this set of questions is at the heart of one of the most important debates of all in democratization studies. And this is the debate about presidentialism versus parliamentarism. And there really are three questions that come out of this that will guide the rest of our discussion and will help us to frame our understanding of, of the issues. First and foremost, are parliamentary democracies or presidential democracies more democratic? Why? Second, are presidential democracies or parliamentary democracies more prone to democratic backsliding? Why? And then third, is semi-presidentialism the best or worst of both worlds? This is a set of questions similar to previous questions in the class about the implications of different types of institutions, different types of arrangements, and in particular, there are implications for the survival of new democracies. When countries transition to democracy, are they more likely to survive as a democracy if they are parliamentary or presidential? When countries transition to democracy, do they obtain and achieve higher levels of democracy if they are presidential or they are parliamentary? Is semi-presidentialism some sort of solution to the limitations of either alternative? Or is it the worst of both worlds? These are the questions that we'll address today and Wednesday. And this is the last unit in our treatment of the different constitutional choices that, that young democracies have and that they make when they, when they inaugurate a, a new democratic system. So our starting point today is pointing out that we can classify different types of democracy. Whenever we talk about a democratic regime, we can distinguish between a presidential regime, a parliamentary regime, and a mixed or a semi-presidential regime. And in fact, these different types of democracies can be as different from one another as different forms of authoritarianism can be from democracy. And so the different types of democracies are quite distinct and we need to understand how they work and how they function to understand their, their different consequences and implications. And whether a democratic regime is parliamentary, presidential or mixed depends on the relationship between the government or the executive, the legislature and the president, if there is one. And so the precise distribution of power and the relationship between different branches or different parts of government is what distinguishes a presidential from a parliamentary from a mixed semi-presidential regime. And so let's get into more detail. Let's talk about what a presidential system is. Now, some of this is review. And I'd, Im I'd imagine that, that many of you have taken Political Science three Comparative Politics, which is where this information will have come from. But if you haven't, no worries. We can cover this material here, and I have no doubt that, that we'll, we'll be fine. But let's talk about a presidential system so that we're all on the same page and we can move forward 
uh, with the thorough understanding of the key concepts. A presidential system is a democracy where the head of government and the head of state are fused. There is a separate election for the president and a separate election for the legislature. Voters elect the president and then they vote to elect the legislature and those are separate elections. We call this independent survival. The president does not depend on a legislative majority to exist. The president and the legislature, legislators are elected for a fixed term. That is to say that a president is elected for four or six years or however many years. And that is the term they are elected to fulfill and to complete. And with few exceptions, that is what they're meant to complete and what they will complete. Now we'll see later that impeachment can remove a president, but generally speaking, and by definition, a president is elected to a fixed term. The president is directly elected by the voters. If you went out and voted on November 3rd, you voted directly for the president as well as potentially directly for your legislator or your senator. The independent survival of the president and the legislature is what defines the presidential system. Now, presidential systems are less common than parliamentary systems. They're most common in Latin America, where about 19 presidential systems exist. They're also relatively common in Africa, where about nine or 10 <clears throat> presidential systems exist. There are some in Europe, but not many. The reason I point this out is because presidential systems are disproportionately represented among new democracies. A lot of the European democracies, the older ones, are parliamentary. Latin American and African democracies are largely presidential. Now a parliamentary system is very different than a presidential system. There are two positions, a head of government and a head of state. The head of government is not chosen directly by the voters, but selected by the legislature. That is typically the prime minister. The prime minister is selected directly by the legislature. A legislative majority selects that prime minister and that prime minister depends on that legislative majority to exist. That means in turn that the government needs confidence of parliament to survive. If the prime minister loses the confidence or the support of the parliament, the legislative majority, the government can fall through what's called a motion of no confidence. And so whereas in a presidential system, a president has a fixed term, in a parliamentary system, a prime minister does not have a fixed term and they can fall at any time if they lose the confidence of parliament and they are voted out through a motion of no confidence. Parliamentary systems are best represented in Europe. They are most common in Europe. And we think <clears throat> usually first and foremost about the UK, countries like Germany, when we think about parliaments. But they do exist elsewhere. It's just that they don't exist that much in Africa and even less so in Latin America. Canada, gosh, um, good question. Let's find out. It's, it's, yeah, it's a parliamentary system. Uh, Justin Trudeau was prime minister. Yeah, it's not a presidential system, uh, but good question, Arturo. Okay, so now that we've set up presidentialism and parliamentarism, we can begin to address one of the most important sets of questions of all, which is, is presidentialism prone to democratic breakdown and democratic backsliding? Are parliamentary democracies safer than presidential democracies when it comes to avoiding backsliding? This intuition that presidentialism might contain the seeds of its own destruction is an old, old claim that goes back to a political scientist and a Latin American named Juan Lins. 
who wrote a very influential article about the perils of presidentialism. And Linz argued that presidentialism undermines democracy. And he said in particular that presidentialism has a number of features that make it prone to crises and that make it likely to lead to backsliding if it's in place in a new democracy. And we'll discuss each of these in detail in turn and even set back for a moment in a second and watch some footage that puts some of it in perspective. But first, there's the peril of dual democratic legitimacy. The fact that independent survival introduces competing democratic institutions who can each claim to speak for the people. There's the peril of rigidity that comes from the fixed term of the directly elected president who can remain in office far beyond their expiration date and give voters no option of removing them. There is the peril of winner take all rules, which relates to a sort of majoritarian, totalistic kind of mindset that can lead to breakdowns in cooperation uh, and can lead actors to be very antagonistic. There is the peril of no reelection in the ways that single term limits in particular in a place like Mexico might make it difficult to accumulate or build institutional memory or expertise uh, or contribute to long term stability. There's the rise of outsiders that comes from the fact that direct election by the voters can result in the election of presidents like, for example, Donald Trump, who have no experience in politics and who might be disruptive uh, or might undermine long established democratic institutions. And then finally, there's the peril of presidentialism and regime breakdown in the ultimate analysis. Linz contended that presidentialism can cause democracy to break down altogether if these different points of contention add up uh, and, and make the, the system unsustainable. So the antidote to all these perils, according to Linz, is parliamentarism, is transitioning from presidential democracy to parliamentary democracy. This antidote is an important one because Lenz insisted that this is not just an academic exercise. The, the choice between presidentialism and parliamentarism couldn't be more important. The stakes couldn't be higher because the survival of democracy and the potential for, for democratic progress is tied up with the type of democracy that is chosen at the outset. So let's begin discussing these different perils. And we'll start with the first one, which is the peril of dual democratic legitimacy. And Linz wrote the following when he described this peril. Who on the basis of democratic principles is better legitimated to speak in the name of the people, the president or the congressional majority that opposes his policies? Since both derive their power from the vote of the people, the conflict is always latent and sometimes likely to erupt dramatically. There is no democratic principle to resolve it. The question arises, who speaks for the people, the president or the congressional majority? In a new democracy, there's always uncertainty about who holds the sort of balance of political power informally. Formally, it's often set up such that different institutions share power. But the question of who actually holds the, the political power is a separate question. And Lenz is saying, that in a presidential democracy, you've got the arrangements set up such that you have contending power brokers or contend, contending claimants, contend, contending uh, claimers of power. An example of this comes from Venezuela where we could say that they have what's referred to as a, a dual power situation. As we've seen since about 2014, Venezuela has been a dictatorship. That doesn't mean though that there's no opposition within the country. Um, the Maduro regime 
controls the executive and is an example of sorting a, of sort of a ruling presidency. But in the legislature, the Congress, the opposition resides and they've ordinarily had a majority. In beginning in 2014, they represented a real counterweight to the Maduro administration. And increasingly since 2014, the parliament, or excuse me, the Congress and the executive controlled by Maduro have each claimed to represent Venezuelans. And they've issued and, and, and put forward contending claims to power in Venezuela. And this is, to put it a different way, an institutional crisis. It is a dual power situation where you have multiple actors sort of contending uh, and claiming to, to represent and speak for the people. Lynn says that this is only possible in a presidential democracy. Only when you have a directly elected executive and a separately elected executive and a separately elected legislature, can you get a situation where the legislature claims to speak for the people and the executive claims to speak for the people simultaneously? Only under that scenario do you get this dual power situation, according to Lenz. Now we'll see in a moment whether that's true, whether it really is true that this can only happen in a presidential system. But according to Lenz, what's happening in Venezuela can be understood as a consequence of the, of the first peril of presidentialism, which is the, the peril of independent survival and dual democratic legitimacy. Let's take a look at what this conflict in Venezuela looks like in real time, this conflict between the Maduro administration on the one hand and the opposition controlled Congress on the other hand. Now, Juan Guaido, pictured here, is an important figure in this discussion because he's routinely been the leader of the opposition in the, the Venezuelan Congress who's spoken on, on behalf of the legislature when claiming to speak for the Venezuelan people in opposition to the executive controlled by Maduro. So let's watch this video. This is pretty shocking footage, so prepare yourself. Now, Luis Parra, he is a government aligned legislator. So he's not aligned with the opposition represented by Guaido. He is aligned with the government. And so when he declares himself the assembly president, he's essentially kind of going to bat for the Maduro administration within the legislature in opposition to Guaido, who henceforth has been the assembly president. So this is the essence of, of the, the, the challenge of dual democratic legitimacy. You have multiple contending democratic institutions claiming to speak for the people and to represent the people. And in Venezuela, the dual power situation, the dual democratic legitimacy situation, the, the challenge of these contending institutions 
um, shows itself in footage like this, where on this particular day, the Maduro administration used the security forces to try to prevent Guaido from entering the legislature because they knew that Guaido would be elected or re-elected assembly president and would continue to represent an opposition Congress who could claim to speak for the people uh, because of the opposition's majority within that Congress. This is a really interesting situation. It's what Lenz described. This is what Lenz said presidentialism leads to. Now, clearly not every presidential system is Venezuela, but this is an extreme example of what can happen um, when there's dual democratic legitimacy. Arturo says, if I may ask this, when we watch things like this, how do we know that the news media is not biased and yellow journaling just as they did when they tried to oust Chavez? Well, to be honest with you, um, Arturo, it's well known what's happening in Venezuela. Uh, the Maduro administration canceled referendums, it's stolen elections, it used the Supreme Court to try to carry out a legislative coup and, and take the powers of the legislature. So I don't know, I don't think all this stuff is being made up. This stuff is being reported by and, and observed by international observers. So we're pretty well um, aware of what's happening. I, I don't know, moreover, if the media really has an interest in covering it up. The truth is that in Venezuela, most of the media is controlled by the government. Most of it has been taken over by the, by the, by the government. And, and so there's actually very little opposition media left. And so most of what's covered in Venezuela is covered by the state media. Back during those days, this is from just recently. The news media was said to be aligned with the CIA back during those days to my understanding. Well, this was just recently, so I don't, um, I don't know what the situation is now, but uh, this is recent. And I, I, to be clear, I, we're not really taking a, a position on who's right or wrong here. All we're doing is observing that there's an institutional crisis and there are competing claims of, of democratic legitimacy. The, the Congress and the, and the executive are both claiming to speak for the people um, and, and this is the nature of the crisis. So it's not to say anything about Guaido, it's not to say anything about Maduro, it's just the nature of the crisis. Let's take a look at another example of dual legitimacy. And this comes from Peru, where President Alberto Fujimori made history in 1992 by dissolving the Congress and saying the following to a reporter who asked him about uh, whether or not it was important for the Congress to exist. Do you really believe that with that elephant-like Congress we had before April 5th, it was feasible to effect a deep reform? How many laws did that Congress produce? You count how many laws Congress produced. We can expect absolutely nothing. This is the reality all the people recognize. This is Fujimori's comment on April 5th, 1992, when he responded to a journalist who asked about his popularly supported dissolution of Congress. Now, what was really noteworthy is that Fujimori had majority support. In Peru at the time, there was deep dissatisfaction with political parties and with established uh, power brokers and elites. And Fujimori was a populist outsider who was viewed favorably by people and voters who had lost faith in the, in the establishment. And so not only did he win a landslide election, but he was popularly supported when he dissolved the Congress. And so in this case, in Peru, Fujimori appeared to speak with, with, with a great deal of support when he claimed that he alone spoke for the people, uh, and so much so that the Congress didn't even have a right to exist. Now, this raises a really interesting question for us. And um, I want to actually reframe this. And it's not just Latin America. It's all new democracies, which includes Latin America, but can include countries in Africa as well as in, in Europe and throughout the world. The question that comes out of this discussion about dual legitimacy and independent survival 
is who speaks for the people in new democracies. If there really is this sort of dispute about who is, is more um, relevant and who is more important in a democracy, is it the president or is it the congressional majority? And I wanna first of all, just create a poll that asks you what you think, because I'm always interested in learning about what students um, from their perspective think is, is, is the case. So give me a moment here to create the question. All right, everyone, I've launched a poll. And the question is, who speaks for the people in presidential democracies? And I'd like to hear from you um, and so that we can get a sense of what everybody thinks. So Arturo is asking a, 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 an important question. In a parliamentary system, would the monarchy be the head of state and the prime minister the head of government? So the prime minister is the head of government. Uh, the head of state would be the president. It's just that the president has different roles in this system, has less power. A prime minister in a parliamentary system basically has the functions that a president has in a presidential system. So though presidents exist in parliamentary systems, they don't have the same responsibilities and powers that a president has in a presidential system. So in a, in a parliamentary system, the prime minister is the, is the main actor, but the difference is that the prime minister is elected or appointed by the, the legislative majority and not directly elected by the the voting public like a president is in a presidential system. So 26 of you have voted, 18 of you or 69% said that legislatures speak for the people in presidential democracies. Eight of you or roughly 31% said that presidents do. 89% of the vote is in, only three votes are left. I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. Take a look at the results and, and, and see how it came out. This is an interesting question because it gets to the heart of one of the core issues in democratic politics, which is, you know, who speaks for who and, and what about the role of representation and who should represent who and what makes democracy democratic from the point of view of representation. Many of you said the legislature speaks for the people and it's the legislature that represents the people. Does anyone want to comment on why they believe the legislature represents the people in a, in a, a presidential democracy? So I thought it was the president be purely because of the way that the president is elected. While Congress, gets to 
get elected from a majority of different constituencies. The president is, with the exception of the U.S., elected by the majority of all the people in the country. So that, to me, is more representative of the will of the country than uh, like particular smaller constituencies that make up differing amounts of people for the legislature. So Ishan says, and this is an interesting point, that look, any individual legislator is only elected by their constituency, their district, right? They're not elected by the whole country. A president, however, has to basically win the whole country, right? They win that, they've got to win that whole constituency. And so in that sense, they represent the whole country more so than a collection of legislators who individually only represent a, a single district. That's an interesting argument. Let's hear from someone who says that the legislature or the congressional majority speaks for the people. Um, so from our argument, I did list that um, the congressional majority does tend to represent the majority of the people. And from what I found, one of the flaws in kind of the presidential election system is the fact that the people are not the ones in charge of electing the president. That's the electoral college's job. They're just being advised by the people. And there have been, there have been many instances where the electoral college, there have been members that have gone against their, that have gone according to their own will, as opposed to the vote that they were, um, in a way, advised to do. While the congressional majority, yeah, each congressional um, member is elected by their own, um, general uh, constituency in their like local area when you compile all of those together and create like as a whole like congress a whole like house and senate we're not talking about a singular member we're talking about like a system with like hundreds of people and because of that inevitably the congressional majority is the bigger representation of the of I guess, quote unquote, the people, just because of the sheer fact that one, their strength in numbers, and two, these are, it's actually a more generally accurate representation of how these portions of America think that aren't necessarily as like lumped together with like a singular president um, election. And also because of the sheer fact that the people really don't choose the president. That's all, they just kind of advise the electoral college. So, so Danielle, a couple things. So very interesting point. When you put all the individual legislators together, they do represent all the districts. Like they all have their own district, but together they represent the whole, um, the whole country, whichever country that is. And so from that perspective, they're representative, just like the, the president is, they're just differently representative. And so that's how I take that point. And that's a good point. I would ask you, so say in the case of the US, we got rid of the electoral college and we just voted directly on the president and it was a popular vote. Does that change your response or do you still think that the congressional majority speaks for the people more so than the president? Well, that would impact my response a little bit. I would still go with the congressional majority because one person, because this, like the idea of just strength in numbers, like the congressional majority, there is, is more generally accurate representation of areas of like smaller areas as opposed to larger areas in America. Whereas the president, um, president is just one person trying to encompass like millions of people as, as ideas. It's easier to have a few hundred people like encompass all those ideas as opposed to like a singular guy or girl, hopefully in the future. Touche. And to add to your point, if the legislature, if individual Congress people are elected based on proportional representation, or if parties name legislators based on proportional representation, that could mean that the, legislator is ev the legislature is even more representative than the presidency, because the presidency is by, by its very nature a winner-take-all race, right? There's only one winner. And so even if you get 49% of the vote, if your if your competitor got fifty one percent, you lose, and your com your competitor wins the presidency. But in a proportional representation legislature, 
it might be the case that every district has 10 or 11 seats and the seats are assigned and distributed according to the proportion of the vote received by individual parties. It could be then in that case that you're not actually wasting, quote unquote, um, a whole big portion of the vote. You're actually apportioning seats according to the, the share that was received. That could be even more representative than the presidency, since the presidency is by definition a winner take all position. And so I think then that there's a lot of potential truth to what many of you argued in your poll uh, response, where you said that maybe the legislature is more representative. I could also see arguments, though, coming from the other side that are even different than Ishan's argument, where you say that the president um, you know, might be more important. For example, there's a conservative uh, perspective that says that the more you distribute or uh, kind of met out power, the less accountability there is. And the, the less accountability there is, the less democratic the system is. And so from that perspective, a single president who has a single responsibility uh, and who can't go to anyone else and blame anyone else might be more accountable than an entire Congress or an, or an entire legislature of, of, of members who might easily escape responsibility or, or accountability in, if things get tough. There are a variety of different ways we can look at this, and I'm, I'm happy to see that we have different points of view. Arturo says the legislature re represents specific districts while the president is elected by a majority vote. Therefore, those who did not vote for them are left out of the equation. But would you say, though, that the legislature, because individual representatives represent only specific districts, could you say, Arturo, that the Congress as a whole uh, is made up of individuals who are all voted for by individual groups and not the whole country, right? So like, like Ishan said, the president is a position that requires winning the whole country. But if, if you're a legislator, you only have to win your district. So does that make the legislature less representative compared to the presidency? If I can add to that a little bit, Please. I feel like while we've already discussed the role of the electoral college in determining the winner of the presidency, I don't think gerrymandering in terms of determining the winner of a legislature gets brought up enough in a discussion of the president versus the legislature. When you have a district that's created for one particular candidate or ideology to win that's not representative of the people despite equal numbers in that district, you're going to have a bunch of constituencies of people with ideologies that aren't representative of that particular city, district, area, or state. So, so gerrymandering is, is obviously you know, very relevant, right? Gerrymandering badly distorts politics packing and cracking, especially minorities and in, in, in voters who are likely to support an opposing party. These are very, very destructive practices. And so that's obviously relevant. Um, and I think that does change the equation if we consider that reality. So Arturo says the legislature, for example, the US has a speaker of the house who is the voice of the legislature. The Senate has their own voice too, but that is a bit biased as they are disproportionately representing little states. Touche, touche, right? Because South Dakota has two senators. California has two senators. You know, it's the same in most countries of the world. The Senate is typically, in countries that have a, a bicameral legislature, uh, the Senate is, uh, is usually, or the upper house is usually geographically based, right? And although it's not always th th this way, it's often the case that every geographic unit will have the same number of representatives in that house or in that part of the assembly. And so Arturo is pointing out accurately that the geographic representation that is equal for all units might not be in sync with the actual size of those different places. And so that might affect representation. And so maybe the president 
is more representative or speaks for the people more so than the Congress if there are questions about how representative the, the Congress itself is. But that's interesting, Arturo, because I thought that at first, I thought that you were saying at first that um, the legislature represents specific districts while the president is elected by a majority vote. Therefore, those who did not vote for them are left out of the equation. It sounded to me at first like Arturo was saying that the legislature might be speak for the people, but Arturo is making some really good points about how there may be geographic representation that distorts the size of the different units and that might undermine representation and make the president more representative or it might make the president more important as a speaker of the people. And so Arturo has one more comment here that I'll say. To me, the, le the, the legislature represents the will of the people. They can impeach an executive Supreme Court justices and the, and the other legislators. Vested in the Constitution, Congress has more power as they did not want to, a king or a queen. Touche, right? And I think that your point about impeachment is, is really a critical point because although it is difficult to impeach a president, that is a power that is vested in the Congress in a presidential system ordinarily. And that not only is a power vested in the legislature that gives them power over the, the executive, it's also a power that Lens doesn't account for. Remember that Lens focuses on how rigid and fixed presidential terms can become and how difficult it is to do away with a president when they're sort of there beyond their expiration date, so to say. Well, impeachment is obviously a process, a legal process that takes place in presidential democracies. And so that is both something that distinguishes the legislature in terms of its powers and something that actually helps us to kind of combat Lindsay's argument about whether or not presidential systems have it in them to, to sort of deal with their crises without the democracy collapsing. Samantha says, the modern day democracy is based on America, right? Historically, the founding fathers did not want to have a single leader have too much power. This is why democracy is meant to be slow. Democracy is supposed to be more than a single leader. So I think that the legislative leaders have more power because they are the ones intended to make laws. We, for, we forget that we have added presidential powers to meet accommodations. So modern day democracy, certainly the United States is the oldest constitutional republic and the oldest constitution. But democracy is an idea and as something that existed goes really back to ancient Greece and, and ancient Rome. Um, although the democracy that existed then was very different than how we conceive of it now, as we know from this class. But more generally, Samantha, you're, you're sort of right. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, there's this idea that democracy is kind of about separating power, right, and minimizing concentrations of power. But the parliamentary worldview, the parliamentary view of democracy really puts more faith in the concentration of power. Let's put it that way, because the parliamentary system is based on, on producing a prime minister from the legislative majority, right? And so the legislative majority and the prime minister basically become one and they kind of rule in, a, in this kind of unilateral way as this kind of unitary actor. And so that's a little bit different than the, the, than the kind of American worldview where we do traditionally distinguish between these, like, these separate powers. Um, but your general point is important, which is that, look, unitary power and the concentration of power that would be consistent with like that parliamentary worldview, it doesn't allow for a slow process where different accountability uh, actors can hold each other liable. It doesn't allow for the kind of um, control that we would hope to exert over our elected officials that a presidential system does. Uh, and so, so maybe the legislature, with, along with the same line of reasoning, maybe the legislature is more important as the speaker of the, of the people. Ishan says, the Senate and the HOR, the House of Representatives are representing different things and demonstrate how legislatures aren't always a majority of people. So Ishan makes another important point, which is that look, the legislature is not always a unitary actor. They don't necessarily speak for the people with one voice. Can they speak with one voice? Or do they not by definition have a lot of 
uh, internal sort of fragmentation in their interests and in their objectives and in the groups that they represent and in the the different policy goals that they that they put forward and so maybe it's not even fair to think about the legislature as a as a unitary actor or as an actor capable of speaking with one voice uh, on behalf of the of the people the point that i want you to see through this discussion is that it is an open question whether the president or the congressional majority speaks for the people, but it's one that is always unresolved. It's one that will remain unresolved and will continue to be the source of, of power struggles inside democracies in Venezuela, as well as in the United States, if, especially if the Democrats win the Senate runoff in Georgia and are able to set up a situation of divided government where a Democratic Congress uh, faces off with, excuse me, uh, no, hold on, <laughs> oh, hold on. We now have a Democratic president. It's, it's possible that we'll have a Democratic Congress as well. But if the Democratic Party loses the runoff in Georgia, we'll have a situation of divided government where the Republican Party controls the Senate. What I want you to see is that in real time, the power struggles that take place between the institutions of government uh, are, are power struggles that can, that can change who speaks for the people and that can change our understanding of the way the democracy will work. So we'll deal with a number of other perils of presidentialism on, on Wednesday and our discussion will continue to analyze parliamentary and presidential democracy and we'll watch some videos on uh, Wednesday in particular videos from Brazil that help us to get an insight into impeachment and in uh, presidentialism. So thank you very much, everybody. I hope you have a great evening and I'll see you on Wednesday.